everybody to today's session. This meeting is being recorded. Thank you. So I think we're recording has now started. So that's great. Um, so today's session is all about antimicrobial stewardship in different settings um, around Australia. Um, and we're very lucky today to be joined by some great panelists. Um, first off, we have Dr. Brendan McMullen. Brendan is a paediatric infectious diseases specialist and microbiologist working at Sydney Children's Hospital at Randwick and UNSW. He's also the chair of the Australia and New Zealand Paediatric Interest Group of the Australasian Society for Infectious Diseases. Brendan's research focuses on the treatment of infections and improving antibiotic use in children. This includes research following involving special groups such as immunocompromised children and newborns. Within this field, he leads research in quality improvement program implementation, patient-centered care and guideline and policy development. Brendan is the lead for the soon to be released multinational good practice recommendations for pediatric antimicrobial stewardship in hospitals, something I'm sure we'll hear about a little bit more about uh, in his presentation. So over to you, Brendan. Thanks so much, Kristen. And um, the organizers for this opportunity to speak, I'll just share my screen now. Double check that's working. Yep, amazing. So um, I just want to also add my acknowledgement of, of country. I'm presenting uh, today from the University of New South Wales, which is on um, land of the Gadigal and Bidjigal of the Eora Nation and extend my uh, respects to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Elders past, present and emerging uh, and those joining us and stakeholders uh, in, in the meetings today. Um, here are my disclosures. Kristen has mentioned that I'm uh, the ACID ANSPA chair at the moment. Um, I'm on, involved in a number of other committees as well, and I, I'm not speaking on behalf of any of these groups today. Um, and I'm a, a site PI on a vaccine trial that's industry sponsored. But again, I'm not speaking about anything to do with that today. So I know this is a diverse audience uh, um, who are passionate about improving antimicrobial use, but who work in all different settings, including some of the amazing co-panelists in this session today. But I wanna to talk to you specifically about pediatric antimicrobial stewardship with a focus on what happens in hospitals, which is really kind of, in a sense, the engine driver of the most complex antimicrobial use uh, and where a lot of antimicrobial resistance starts and is perpetuated. So to take a step back, this is a statement from the then Director General of the World uh, Health Organization, Dr. Margaret Chan. And she made this statement on World Health Day um, towards the end of 2011, so over 10 years ago. And she pointed out that when the first antibiotics were introduced in the 40s, they were miracle drugs and they were rightly hailed so. So widespread infections that killed millions of people could now be cured. And what I want to point out here is that she specifically highlighted pediatric infections here. So the risk of death from something so common as strep throat or a child's scratch knee virtually vanished with antibiotics. But then the sting in the tail the world is on the brink of losing these miracle cues. And this is one of the drivers for what we're doing. So I know some of this crowd will be very familiar with this, but there are particular challenges with pediatric antimicrobial stewardship, whether in the hospital or community setting. So this includes body size. We can't give a, a standard dose of a drug for just about anything because prescribing varies substantially according to the weight of the child principally um, for most drugs. Drug metabolism and toxicity changes during the age spectrum, especially in the very extremes of life, which includes the very beginning. Swallowing uh, the drug formulation and palatability are really key issues for um, antimicrobial adherence in children, uh, as, uh, as every parent will know and, and everyone who works in child health. And obtaining and maintaining intravenous access is substantially harder for children than it is for most adults. 
the response to infection varies by age. And there's something of a cliche that children can get sick very quickly, but recover very quickly in a way that amazes those uh, who are less familiar with this area of medicine. But also the spectrum of organisms causing disease um, changes with age. Um, once again, uh, with the most uh, extreme uh, changes seen um, in the very, very early months of life. In children, as you may know, distinguishing viral from bacterial illnesses or even mixed infections is really challenging. Um, and it doesn't help that uh, our patients are often not able to give a very comprehensive history of what's going on. Fortunately, often we have parents and carers who can provide some of that. Local susceptibility data for, anti, for microorganisms to antimicrobials uh, may vary systematically from the data in adults, but is often not available. We very rarely get pediatric specific antibiograms, and sometimes that's even true in um, institutions that see a relatively large number of children. We don't yet have national antimicrobial susceptibility data appropriate for children, although that is something on the horizon and we may have a chance to briefly touch on that. And children also do something called travel by proxy in a way that's much more common in this group than with adults. So children may not travel to areas um, uh, where um, uh, organisms that are not endemic in the setting in which we work are endemic, but their parents, carers and relatives may, and um, children may subsequently be exposed to these organisms in the home. And so have, have cryptic presentations of what are otherwise considered travel related illnesses. And so those of us who work um, in child health, uh, including in the hospital setting, need to consider all of these things with paediatric antimicrobial prescribing. And so when you're not doing that every day, I understand that's a challenge. So what does this lead to? Here is um, a paraphrased uh, list of conversations that I have genuinely had with uh, various um, uh, uh, clinicians, um, all of whom had to um, at least occasionally provide some healthcare to children. So um, some of the response to why uh, paediatric antimicrobial um, stewardship or specific um, uh, policies for kids are not available are that there aren't, aren't very many children seen by this institution as a proportion of their total patients. So perhaps it's okay to leave the children out of the policy or this is already covered. They just call the children's hospital. And of course, we know that's that's not really adequate governance. Children's hospital usually doesn't have a, any direct uh, reporting line or any way of ensuring that their advice is actually uh, followed. Uh, some people have said there's little drug resistance in kids, so AMS is not required. Um, and uh, of course, that's not true. But even if it were true, as I know others have presented in this series, um, antimicrobial stewardship is not just about preventing and managing antimicrobial resistance, but is a, um, is a holistic patient safety exercise. Uh, some providers have, have um, understandably said this is out, out of my scope of competence, to which I think the reply should be, well, um, if you look after children in any capacity, um, that needs to be taken into account in your scope of comp competence. And then we're not resourced for this. Again, understandably, resource constraints exist everywhere. And so essentially this means the answer is too hard. And so sometimes children uh, and uh, neonates are left out of antimicrobial stewardship policies and programs. Now, the concept of uh, the importance and the structure of antimicrobial stewardship programs is not new. Um, it's been around for, for some years, um, and this paper in 2007 by Dellert and colleagues uh, in, in clinical infectious diseases is a, a really key landmark paper um, for hospital antimicrobial stewardship programs. It's, it's a joint publication from the IDSA um, and the Society for Healthcare Epidemiology of America, um, and it really set the bar um, and set many people um, working on hospital antimicrobial stewardship programs, um, especially in well-resourced settings. Um, um, 
uh, uh, countries like, like Australia. I um, uh, completed my uh, PhD last year looking at um, antimicrobial stewardship and antimicrobial use in children. And as part of that, I looked at the literature um, uh, published since uh, that paper in 2007 on antimicrobial stewardship. Um, and of um, over 7,000 papers published, less than 2% really could be applied to paediatric antimicrobial stewardship, certainly in the hospital setting. Uh, of course, children make a substantially larger uh, pop uh, proportion of the population than that. Uh, and given their special needs and complexity, this means that they are as yet underrepresented in the literature. We also uh, know that it's not just in Australia and not just in the anecdotes I've shared to you that, that um, we don't actually have enough in terms of paediatric AMS programs uh, or, or guidelines or resources, even in other well-resourced settings. So this is a, a survey that was recently published um, looking at paediatric AMS in 23 European countries. Um, uh, by a group of authors, including a colleague of mine, Sanjay Patel, who uh, um, is an, an important lead for paediatric AMS working in the UK. So uh, a national a, a survey was sent out um, to multiple countries uh, within Europe. And I'll highlight some of the results. So um, of the, the 23 respondents, as you can see, most countries, but not all, had national guidelines for inpatient management of children with common infections. Um, but only a minority of those had been updated in the last uh, four years. Thinking about our Australian comparison, I would say, arguably, we have somewhat national guidelines for the inpatient management of children with common infections, including um, the acid ansbit guidelines, which I will allude to later on, and therapeutic guidelines antibiotic, but this certainly could be uh, improved and is a work in progress. Very few countries had agreed metrics for the quantity of antimicrobial prescribing in children. Uh, and those that did were usually using WHO defined daily doses, which as we know, are really not adequate for measuring antibiotic prescribing in children. We also don't have this in Australia, although there is work happening, including with the NORSP program, to have a days of therapy metric that can be used for benchmarking in Australian children. Is there a national paediatric antimicrobial stewardship in place? Well, the answer is no for most countries in Europe too. I think we have an informal paediatric antimicrobial stewardship network in Australia, but once again, there's room for improvement. And finally, have national paediatric antimicrobial stewardship competencies been developed in your country? Once again, the answer is no in most places. And I think we don't have really explicit paediatric antimicrobial stewardship competencies or guidelines in Australia yet which leads on to some of the work I'll talk about next. So obviously this is a big piece of work uh, that needs to have multidisciplinary involvement across all sectors at finding solutions. And so here is part of the solution, I think, or at least a step in that direction. So uh, we decided that paediatric AMS good practice recommendations were required. And the rationale was to develop recommendations for healthcare providers caring for infants, children, and adolescents in hospital as a first step. We sought collaboration and representation from uh, representative groups and networks within Europe, North America, and Aotearoa, New Zealand, and Australia, where um, the chairs of this program were working. The purpose of these recommendations was to enable clinicians to advocate for resources once they're available, to provide guidance for paediatric AMS teams to improve service delivery, to provide guidance on prioritizing elements of AMS strategy, and to promote benchmarking for AMS programs. 
How did we do this? Well, an expert steering committee was assembled in 2019, and this included paediatric AMS and infectious diseases physicians, AMS pharmacists, uh, and nurses from the three global regions I mentioned before. The regional chairs, uh, which included Sanjay Patel from the UK, Jason Newland from the United States of America, and myself from Australia, conducted an initial literature review and drafted some initial recommendations. And then of course, in 2020, COVID happened and getting uh, any um, guideline or good practice recommendation requiring heavy collaboration from those working in the field of infectious diseases became quite a challenge. Nonetheless, during this time, we were able to uh, push on with great help from our steering group, um, which in our region included Penelope Bryant, um, uh, a paediatric AMS and ID physician from Melbourne, Australia, and Eamon Duffy, an AMS pharmacist from New Zealand. Um, so this group, um, including many international collaborators, were sent the draft um, recommendations and a planned survey methodology in early 2021 and were asked to provide feedback. And we were able to come up with recommendations that we were happy to send for wider stakeholder consultation. So we then sent out an electronic survey to rate importance, feasibility, and perceived barriers to the proposed recommendations. Some of you may have answered that survey um, because we included people who had in indicated an interest in paediatric antimicrobial stewardship through the, um, through the ANSPIT group. We then planned to publish the endorsed recommendations and promote this among collaborating networks. So here are the recommendations. You are one of the first group of people seeing this, and these are now uh, the manuscript describing this process in much more detail, including the results of the survey, are in press in the Lancet Infectious Diseases. We've divided this recommendation into three sections with 10 recommendations that have a, a simple one word um, heading um, and more detail in the recommendation. And so I'll go through them now. Guidelines. So we think that hospitals should provide prescribers with access to current evidence-based and endorsed uh, antimicrobial guidelines, which are suitable for children. Expert advice. We think that hospitals should ensure prescribers have access to expert advice in paediatric infection management. So this may not be through local personnel, although it may be if they're available, it can also be provided through networks of care, including arrangements with, with experts in other, in other hospitals. And education. We think hospitals should provide access to education on the management of common infections, which are suitable for prescribers and other clinicians. Okay. The next section um, uh, is, is about representation really. So all hospitals which provide care to children should explicitly include children in AMS strategies. Um, so that means that AMS committees in hospitals which care for both adults and children need to at least include a representative from the paediatric service on their AMS committee. And paediatric hospitals which have AMS committees need to include representatives from the relevant groups in that hospital. And we have reinforced in access to data that these AMS committees should have access to actual prescribing data. And we recommend that if it can be collected quantitatively, that we use um, the most appropriate measure, um, days of therapy per thousand bed days or per thousand patient days. Again, in the same section, um, AMS reporting is important. So you, you have to actually report on your data to relevant stakeholders and do something about your findings funding. This was the most controversial uh, recommendation in the North American setting, but we got it over the line with um, uh, almost everyone considering it important um, and most people considering it theoretically feasible. So hospitals should have access to funding and appropriate resources to undertake AMS for children. And inclusion. Hospitals which care for adults and children and who have some funding for AMS should include provision of AMS for children. It's not acceptable to leave them out of the policy. And then the final section. So we don't 
we need to move out of our own um, isolated silos and work together. So hospitals should have access to regional or national networks for benchmarking of paediatric AMS indicators, and we need to agree what those are, as well as sharing practice improvements and incentives. So I think Australia has um, in some ways been a world leader in um, tying hospital accreditation to um, AMS standards. We need to explicitly include children in that for services that provide care to children. Okay, those are the pediatric AMS recommendations. Um, I'm not gonna talk about the, the, the survey process further except to say that um, um, it was strongly endorsed, and when that um, uh, um, paper is available in the in the Lancet ID soon, all of that detail will be there. But of course, recommendations are only one part of the story. Um, we do need to build on existing strengths. So this is a um, a guideline that involves many ANSPED members um, from all around um, Australia and some input from New Zealand as well um, on antibiotic duration and IV to oral switch. Uh, and this is a um, an example summary card that's freely available at the Australasian Society for Infectious Diseases website there, www.acid.au. Um, but the, there is a, a link to a, a fuller guideline with much more information. So we need to build on uh, these existing resources. Um, and I've been doing some additional work with others on implementing uh, and showing that you can um, use a multidisciplinary approach um, with clinicians in your hospital to uh, safely implement these recommendations and improve your um, timely antimicrobial switch uh, and optimal antibiotic duration. Uh, and this is some work that uh, Sanjay Patel, who was one of the, the co-chairs of the Paediatric AMS Good Practice Recommendations, has done in the UK um, with some management of common infection pathways suitable for multiple settings um, that see children uh, and which has adapted some of the ANSPED work um, uh, for their recommendations. But even though this is written for a UK setting, these, these BSAC pathways, they're really often very adaptable to our setting uh, and we can make use of, of these pathways uh, and adapt them for our settings. Uh, and then coming to the end of my talk, I, I want to acknowledge that, of course, talking about kids in hospital in well-resourced countries like Australia, for all our limitations, uh, is really just the tip of the iceberg of uh, um, the antimicrobial resistance and antimicrobial stewardship story. Um, so um, whatever we do here, it's not enough to only do things in our setting. The World Society of Pediatric Infectious Diseases has, has made a declaration with this paper published in 2018 uh, on the importance of combating antimicrobial resistance in children. Uh, this really has a global health focus and there are five key uh, domains to this declaration. I highly recommend that people read that uh, and we need to collaborate with, um, with our colleagues in different areas of the world uh, to support, support local efforts in um, antimicrobial stewardship as well as combating antimicrobial resistance. Uh, and of course, that didn't end there. Um, further to this, um, there have been a series of very nice articles uh, involving researchers from both low and middle income country settings and high income country settings, looking at the real uh, situation on the ground of antimicrobial stewardship and infection control in these settings, pointing out some of the deficiencies and problems and finding opportunities uh, for collaboration and change. Um, and of course, uh, we don't, we can't just publish guidelines and, and uh, say that's that. We actually need advocacy to embed recommendations to improve practice in practice. We need advocacy, um, not just beyond the high income country setting, but beyond the tertiary setting, uh, including into community care and many other aspects of care that uh, some of the panelists in this, in this um, session will talk about. And as I mentioned before, we need to uh, genuine, we need to encourage genuine collaboration, um, uh, supporting those working beyond high resource settings. So I just want to acknowledge um, in particular um, 
the collaborators for the pediatric AMS good practice recommendations, um, as well as uh, ANSPED and the people who answered the survey, many other um, collaborators. The, um, the recommendations will look much nicer <laughs> when they're published um, and we'll promote them in a number of, um, a number of different fora. So I hope you'll take a chance to check them out. Um, if you want to contact me further, there's my email address as well as my Twitter ID while Twitter still lasts. So thank you again. Thanks so much for that, Brendan. Um, thank you for your wonderful presentation. So I would encourage um, any of our participants who've got specific questions for Brendan to pop them into the chat um, and we can monitor those there. Um, there will also be an opportunity for a panel discussion at the end. So uh, we'll probably just keep the questions now to specific content to Brendan's presentation. Any specific questions coming through right now? Not that I can see. Brendan, I had a question. In terms of the recommendations um, that have been um, developed, they looked excellent. Um, and I'm really glad you highlighted the considerations for different resource settings. Um, I was just wondering if there was any consideration about um, tailoring the recommendations to resource settings um, as to, or just keeping them as a kind of a bundle of the one set of recommendations. Yeah, that's a great question, Kristen. We have thought about that as a next step. So we wanted to kind of start local. We managed to get collaboration in the places where we work. Um, and I haven't said this yet because it's not quite complete, um, but we're seeking endorsement from a number of international, multinational societies for these guidelines. We've already got endorsement from ACID ANSPED. Um, endorsement from the British Society for Antimicrobial Chemotherapy, endorsement for, for SGAP, the Antimicrobial Stewardship Arm of the European Society for Clinical Microbiology and ID. We're just still um, approaching a couple of other uh, groups, but we want to promote that in our own kind of settings where we work first. And then some of us are already doing work with, us, with um, people in other settings. We then want to work with people in other settings to kind of adapt these or make it possible for them to adapt these for their settings so it can be truly useful as a, as a tool for saying these are the standards to help us, you know, think about how to include children um, in paediatric AMS. Okay, thanks, Brendan. We've also got one question here from Magda Raban. Um, she said, thank you for the great presentation. What is the progress of Australian hospitals in adopting the recommendation, including City Children Hospitals Network? and also hospitals that are not paediatric specific? Uh, no one has seen these yet, uh, oh. apart from you. And- um, So uh, not very good progress so far. A couple of people, yeah. So I am hoping that we can have another chat down the track on, on how things have gone with people, um, people adopting the recommendations. Thanks. Yeah, and I think, and I think that's also kind of answer um, Gab's question there about compliance. So once you've had time to um, advocate the, the recommendations. Stay tuned next Antimicrobial Awareness Week for uh, another presentation about um, the compliance to the recommendations. Okay, so thanks very much for the questions, everyone. We might move on to our next speaker. So our next speaker that we're lucky to have with us is Dr. Leanne Teo. Leanne is a triple threat. She's a dentist, she's a pharmacist, and she's a lecturer of dental therapeutics. She's an early career research fellow at the Melbourne Dental School. She's part of the Australian Dental Association Therapeutics Committee and was a founding member of the Global Antibiotic Research Dental Network with the FDI uh, World Dental Federation. Her Fantastic. interest... <laughs> Thanks. Thanks, I forgot. Leanne. <laughs> <It's going. laughs> That's okay. I'll just finish off uh, your... Um, illustrious uh, contributions. Her research interests are on various aspects of mental medicine use in dentistry, prescribing practices and dental and anti-opioid stewardship. She's co-authored numerous dental national guidelines, therapeutic guidelines, oral and dental version two, and she's an editorial board member for the BMC Oral Health. Thanks so much, Leanne. Thanks very much. I'll just share my screen. Lovely. Um... I think that's all, all good. Thank you very much. As Kristen was saying, I am a pharmacist and dentist. 
And what um, I suppose led me to this area of research was actually by um, working as a pharmacist and dispensing dental prescriptions. And as I, I worked, I would often notice that dental prescriptions um, were sometimes inaccurate or less than ideal. And after a while and years of noticing this, I thought I could actually try and do something about it in the form of research to try and develop interventions to improve prescribing. And of course, that in dentistry, that's very much um, primarily antibiotics because antibiotics are the, are the um, class of drugs that dentists prescribe the most. And so in today's session, I'll be talking about the role of antibiotics in dentistry. I know everyone here are very well versed in stewardship and antibiotic stewardship, um, but not, I don't think there's many dentists in the, in the audience. So I'll talk a little bit about um, antibiotics in dentistry and when they're used, and then, then move on to what dental prescribing is actually like and rates of inappropriate dental prescribing. And then, of course, finish up with stewardship and, and why stewardship is necessary in, in dentistry as well. So starting off with antibiotics in dentistry. So in, uh, in dentistry, dentistry is really all about dental treatment and not drugs. And when someone presents with a tooth infection or toothache, um, they're generally the most, what, what people really need to receive is dental treatment. So the dentist is able to address the cause. I think it's a little bit different from from general practice medicine. If someone has an earache or a bacterial chest infection, they could get some antibiotics and rest and, and get the time and feel better. But dentistry really, um, the dentist has to get in there and do some treatment. And generally speaking, for most dental infections, that will be a tooth extraction. Um, I think someone may have a, a crack in a tooth or a, a big hole, um, so their tooth will have to come out. Or root canal treatment where we get to open up the tooth and stick some files in the tooth roots, and that's all quite fun, um, perhaps for, um, for, for the dentist. But for localised infections, dental treatment is what um, people need and they don't need antibiotics. Antibiotics are only needed when the infection has spread beyond the confines of the tooth. The person may have a facial swelling, um, for example, or a, temp a high temperature or um, lymph node involvement. And that's when antibiotics would be needed in addition to dental treatment. Um, and doing dental treatment is very important when it comes to um, managing these infections. Dentistry is all about treatment and not, not drugs. But like in all aspects of medicine, when we need antibiotics to work, we really need them to work. And if a, a tooth infection hasn't been managed effectively and spreads, it can lead to a severe um, spreading infection, which like in the case of the photo is a medical emergency. Lower teeth infections tend to spread to the neck and upper tooth infections tend to spread to the sinus and to the eye. And certainly in these situations, antibiotics are needed urgently um, and dental treatment as well to address the cause of the infection. Uh, we know that antibiotic resistance in general um, varies between time and place, and there's very um, relatively limited um, antibiograms, I suppose, of in, when it comes to tooth infections. The only study that I'm uh, aware of about antibiotic resistance in odontogenic infections or tooth infections was a retrospective study uh, looking at severe tooth infections in the South Australian population, where in these patients that there were severe tooth infections where the patients required hospitalization. 11% of these infections were penicillin resistant and 13% resistant to multiple antibiotics. And within these infections, the penicillin resistant tooth infections and multiple resistant tooth infections were associated with poorer clinical outcomes, longer hospital stays, and um, higher rates of non response to initial surgical therapy. Um, and so, in that context, Antibiotic resistance is very important when it comes to dentistry managing, being able to manage these infections. Um, and so that leads me on now to the next section about inappropriate dental antibiotic prescribing, what dental prescribing is actually like. So as I was mentioning before, there's really, really relatively few reasons for dentists to prescribe um, antibiotics. As I said, the majority of infections are taken care of by doing actual dental treatments, especially in community practice dentistry. but Dental antibiotic prescribing accounts for 10% of all prescribed antibiotics worldwide. But of the antibiotics prescribed by dentists, up to 80% are actually inappropriate. And that's for both therapeutic and prophylactic reasons. Um, and that's, um, and again, depending on, on where you are in the world, it's, um, it can be for therapeutic or prophylactic reasons. In Australia and the UK, for example, that's pro, um, primarily therapeutic reasons and US prophylactic reasons, as we know from the literature um, at the moment. Most of this overprescribing is generally seen for localised infections. So dental treatment alone would suffice. Dentists tend to do the, um, do the, the dental treatment 
for a localized infection, but they also give antibiotics on top of that um, as well, despite the fact that it's, it's not necessary. That's what the majority of overprescribing is seen. But prescribing decisions are actually really complex and um, there's a lot of factors and non-clinical factors that influence prescribing and inappropriate prescribing, uh, especially in dentistry. So in a self-reported survey that we conducted a couple of years ago, a few years ago now actually, um, from about, prescri about uh, prescribing in dentistry, we found that in Australia, 77% of Australian dentists on a routine or occasional basis would prescribe antibiotics if they're running late. Up to 82% of dentists will encounter patients who expect or request antibiotics instead of treatment. Not that they would necessarily prescribe, but patient expectations is, is really common in dentistry. Um, and 67% of dentists will prescribe antibiotics on a routine or occasional basis if they're unsure of a diagnosis. So lots of non-clinical factors that influence prescribing um, as well. But we're not alone. And in many self-reported surveys, uh, world, in many surveys where um, obviously dentists self-report their prescribing habits worldwide has shown similar results to, very, to some varying degrees. So for example, in the US, about a third of um, endodontists, so root canal specialists, will prescribe antibiotics because of patient expectations. Uh, almost 40% of Swiss dentists will prescribe antibiotics occasionally if they, if they weren't sure of a diagnosis, but the situation sounded like a, an infection was present. Anwen Cope and her team in 2016 in Wales uh, demonstrated in a cross-sectional study, uh, which is one of the, the first ones to come out in this area, that the odds of a patient who would be prescribed an antibiotic, even if there was no infection present. Um, if the patient didn't want to accept treatment, odds ratio was 4.9 and requested for antibiotics, as you can see in my slide, is 3.7. And if the dentist was running late, the odds ratio was 10.2. And I think a lot of the unwilling to accept treatment and request for antibiotics stems from what I was saying before about how infections are generally treated in other aspects, like in general practice um, medicine, where patients are used to getting antibiotics to, to help, help an infection. And, and so having dental treatment, which is often something that's going to feel quite invasive for a patient, can sometimes be overwhelming. People don't always want to, who are not expecting to have a root canal done or a, a tooth extracted on that day sometimes. Um, obviously, it um, can be a lot for some patients to process as well. And part of the fact that as well, you know, in dentistry, anxiety, dental anxiety is very common and people often don't like coming to the dentist. So all those factors compound in, in patients requesting for antibiotics and can be unwilling to accept treatment. So certainly uh, prescribing decisions are very complex and are influenced by many factors, both clinical as well as non-clinical. So again, I, I, if I'm listening here, I know that I work really well versed in stewardship. We know that duration of antibiotics is also um, really important as well. Longer, obviously, longer courses will predispose more towards resistance, contribute more towards selection of antibiotic resistance compared to shorter courses. And in our guidelines in Australia, we uh, the duration of antibiotic therapy is five days, but we know from our studies that most dentists prescribe longer, about often more closer to a week. And that's because a lot of dentists here we found from our research tend to prescribe according to the PBS pack size they take, take until the course is all finished, which generally ends up being a week and a bit longer than necessary. But again, we're not alone and other studies have shown longer courses as well. So in Spain, uh, in a, another study, the dentists and also to tend to prescribe an average for a week as well. And uh, Mike Durkin and his team in the US showed that dentists um, in the US on average prescribe for seven to 10 days. But what is the right course? Like what is the appropriate duration of antibiotic therapy for a tooth infection? And so to answer that question, and also looking at what the most, I suppose, ideal antibiotic is to manage a tooth infection, we conducted a systematic review. Um, this was published, I think it was last year or the year before, looking at what, um, what was the most ideal antibiotic and also for how long as well. In our systematic review, there were two key findings. The first was that, um, it didn't really seem to matter which antibiotic was given, whether it be a narrow spectrum antibiotic or a broad spectrum antibiotic. Both of them appeared to be equally as effective, but the disclaimer was that dental treatment had to be done to address the cause. So in these infections where people presented with a, a facial swelling where they needed antibiotics, the key factor in the successful management for these patients was, was dental treatment to actually address the cause. The second key finding from the systematic review 
was that shorter courses, so three to five days, were just as effective as longer courses. And the main factor here was that as, as long as dental treatment, again, was done to address the cause of the infection. Dental, dentistry is really all about dental treatment and not drugs. And so given that uh, around 80% of antibiotics in dentistry are overprescribed for various reasons, um, and there's so many factors that influence prescribing, dentists generally tend to prescribe for too long a duration, has certainly led to the support of dentists and dental teams um, being included in antibiotic stewardship programs. And so while this is, I think, relatively new in comparison to um, other aspects of health, there's been a few studies uh, conducted, generally short-lived or pilot studies, that aim to improve prescribing antibody prescribing in dentistry. Um, and generally there are, in terms of the interventions and what they use to be able to improve in antibody prescribing, they're generally bundles of interventions. It's recognized that these prescribing decisions in dentistry are complex. There's many, there's many factors that influence, influence prescribing. Um, and as such, they generally tend to be customized bundles of interventions. So audit and feedback or audit and, audit and guidelines um, and often education features as well. So one of the other earlier talks in this um, series, I think it was on the, the Friday um, at NCAS, um, that was saying that you know, in, with AMS, there's no one size fits all. And I think that's very true for dentistry. So uh, most places will have um, they've used uh, different combinations of, 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 um, of interventions to be able to, to target, um, it, to improve prescribing in dental practice. Because there's several studies that can that have been conducted so far, um, certainly not nowhere near as many as medicine, obviously. Um, a lot of these, the, a lot of the these studies coming through tend to measure slightly have slightly different measurements on how to evaluate the effectiveness of their studies. And in such, it can be difficult to compare these studies internationally. So last year, I was part of a steering committee where to try and develop or to, to develop a um, core outcome set for uh, the outcomes that should be reported in antibiotic stewardship interventions in dentistry. It was led by Wendy Thompson in the University of Manchester, who's a, a, a key person in this space. And she conducted a, a Delphi study. We had uh, three stakeholder groups. We had dental academics, um, clinicians, and also had patients who had experience with antibiotic resistance or um, antibiotic resistance be involved in the Delphi panel. And so the, the protocol has been published, but the results are still under uh, review and hopefully will be, will be published soon. And there's certainly both qualitative and quantitative measurements that came out of that in order to be able to um, standardize reporting of these um, interventions as they slowly come through and then to be able to, uh, to enable international comparisons. The FDI World Dental Federation, I really wanted to point out their involvement as well because they've done a lot of work in this space uh, when it comes on the pop-up box on my screen. Um, they've, yeah, they've done a lot of work in this space um, in, in the area of antimicrobial resistance in dentistry. So they've uh, had three key uh, uh, projects. One of the first one was a white paper that was produced a few years, a couple of years ago now, and that certainly provides a framework for um, dental teams in order to be able to implement antibiotic stewardship. It focuses on um, inappropriate prescribing, the effect of guidelines, as well, um, stewardship, and also on infection control as well in dentistry. There is also a massive online open course, and it's free, if anyone, anyone's interested. Um, there were six educators, so we got to participate in um, producing this um, online open course, part of which was conducted with FDI, World Dental Federation, as well as the British Society of Antimicrobial Chemotherapy, talking about different aspects of antibiotic resistance and stewardship and how it applies to dentists and dental teams and what, what can be done about it on a day-to-day -day, um, basis. And also alerting dentists, because this is a relatively, this is a relatively new concept, I think, in dentistry in general. Um, so it's, it's great that it's been, certainly been recognized at the top level, as I said, but really still get to permeate, um, I think, into clinical practice. And lastly, for the FGI as well, there's been the establishment of the, um, the GARD network, um, as Kristen mentioned in my introduction, the Global Antibiotic Resistance Dental Network Groups and ECR network. They're not strictly, not, you initially started being ECRs, we're not strict to all ECRs, 
but there's certainly not many of us looking at um, this area of research. Um, but when we but we all get together once a month to um, to um, present in the general club and see what our people are doing in um, in different countries around around the world in, in this area and different um, challenges, I suppose, um, that present in different countries as well. So some other organisations also have led have recently some recent months and not so recent led to support of um, dentistry within this space. Um, for, I'm sure a lot of you would be familiar with the coil limits of our patient and body stewardship that put, um, that document from the CDC back in 2016, which obviously looks at other elements such as um, making commitment to antibiotic um, stewardship, audit and um, feedback, tracking, reporting, and of course, uh, being able to provide education um, to clinicians with regards to antibiotic stewardship. And they included dentists and dental teams. That was published in 2016. I thought that was very progressive of them. And recently, as in this week, the World Health Organization launched their uh, global oral health action plan. So we, um, as part of FDI, we got to have uh, input into the oral health action plan earlier on in the year. And the World Health Organization, of course, that oral health action plan focuses on uh, over, -pres um, over prescribing the clinical and non-clinical factors that influence prescribing um, antibiotic resistance in relation to dentistry, stewardship, but it also focuses a lot on, which is great, on universal health coverage. I think that's really key because the it's so um, important that patients, that people, we all get access to dental care and preventive dental care. And that's really integral for antibiotic stewardship because when people are able to access preventive dental care, the fillings and cleans that dentists do every day uh, within our, our practice, um, is so important when it comes to preventing infections because when there's less tooth decay and less gum disease, there's less chance of tooth infections and so reduced need for antibiotics. So universal health coverage, access to dental care is, um, is really key when it comes to antibiotic stewardship in dentistry. And of course, um, the um, Australian Commission of Safety and Quality in Healthcare, um, as Kristen will know, has a whole chapter in their AMS book dedicated to antibiotic um, antimicrobial stewardship in dental practice. Again, very progressive to have a whole chapter dedicated to dentistry, which is, um, which, is, which is fantastic. And so I thought I would just finish up my talk now about an intervention that I conducted um, during my PhD, which I finished um, the, my PhD last year. And in, uh, within the health learning system, this really fits into the, the knowledge to practice um, um, area. So I think in, dentistry, at least in Australia anyway, there are really two unmet needs. And the first one, of course, is the high rates of overprescribing as I've already illustrated. But the second uh, factor, which is a sort of an unmet need in dentistry is really there's no drug resource available specific for dentists. We obviously have a lot of drug compendia available at the pharmacy side. Certainly we're, we're all aware of the various drug compendia that are available, but there's none really specific for dentistry, none that provides really dentally relevant information that clinicians need to know chair side. And so given those two unmet needs, um, during, my inter during my PhD developed um, Drugs for Dent, a digital clinical decision tool to help dentists with appropriate prescribing, um, but also with um, providing dentally relevant drug knowledge as well. And as I said, this um, fits in the knowledge of practice um, domain of the, the learning health system, taking the knowledge that we have of inappropriate prescribing and the various factors that influence prescribing and developing a prototype to try and improve uh, prescribing in this space. And so we uh, did a, a, we trialed drugs for dent in addition with education to try and improve dental prescribing as in a pilot study, which lasted for uh, 12 weeks. So we had 26 dentists involved as a pilot study. We got them to record their prescribing for six weeks. And we gave, then gave the dentists our intervention, which was drugs for dent, as well as an education session. So I was saying that a lot of AMS uh, interventions of dentistry tend to be bundled within of um, interventions. We got the dentists then record their prescribing for another six weeks and compared the prescribing before and after the um, intervention for accuracy, for quantity, and also appropriateness according to our dental therapeutic guidelines. And so in terms of results, we got a 41% reduction in the number, number of antibiotics prescribed and a 45% reduction in inappropriate indications for why dentists prescribed antibiotics. 
when we look at the top three antibiotics most commonly prescribed, we had an increase in the appropriateness of those as well. And that was mostly to do with duration. Um, dentists tended to get the dose and the frequency correct, but it was the duration that was generally too long. So that improved after they had the education session. And so that was back in during my PhD from 2018 to about 2020 or so, where we had the, we trialed that our drug to dent in the pre post and pilot study. And so given the, the, the great results that we got from our pilot study and the potential for drug to dent to have a positive impact on dental clinical practice, we got further funding last year and had the opportunity to further develop drugs to dent. So I thought I would just show a couple um, aspects of the upgraded drugs to dent that dentists, uh, that, that were really well received. So the login page now looks like that. The first prototype was quite clunky and it didn't have, it was on a very, very small budget. Um, and so when the dentist logs in, they, one of the first sections they get to see is current medications. And in this section, this is where the dentally relevant information comes in. The, the dentist can put in any drug that they, they're after. It tells them just the really bare key information that they need to know about drugs, but specifically tells them any dental procedural considerations, what dentists need to know about drugs in order to do dental treatment. Because we found from our research that dentists just really uh, just want to be able to practice safely and with respect to medication use. And also finding oral adverse effects, we've put, we've put them in here, of course, they're actually very hard to find if drug product information, you have to really sift through the whole, um, there's no specific area that's, that's for the oral cavity. And so we put that in as well in order for dentists to be aware of what, if what they were seeing could be uh, reflected in their, their clinical exam. Another section that we had in, which was also really well received, was uh, what we call prescribing guidelines. And in this section, the dentist could select from several clinical scenarios and it would provide a, a patient explanation and a dentist explanation about whether the antibiotics are, are not recommended in this section. And this section was aimed, of course, at patient, primarily patient education, since we have such high rates of patient expectations for antibiotics here um, in Australia. So a couple of sections that dentists really um, really liked about, about drugs for dent. And so in 2020, we did our pre-post pilot study with a 41% reduction in the quantity of prescribed antibiotics and the 45% reduction in inappropriate indications for antibiotic prescribing. And then last year, we had further funding to improve drugs for dent and we beta, we beta tested drugs for dent with 10 dentists. Got some really good, great feedback, um, which, was, which was really good. Um, and then earlier on this year, we also tested, gave, um, our final year dent, our doctor for dental surgery students, our final year dental students, drug to dent as well. And in the pre post survey, their confidence with prescribing and drug knowledge increased from five to eight out of 10 um, with drug to dent. So it certainly has great potential um, to be um, implemented in, in clinical practice as well. And so that's been our development of drug to dent um, so far. So, in terms of our plans for drug to dent for 2023 and beyond, well, they're still in development at the moment, um, but it certainly has great potential to be integrated into clinical practice and certainly together with education, which was what the original intervention was in the pilot study, has great potential to be an effective antibiotic stewardship tool to improve prescribing, but also to help um, dentists with um, access to dentally relevant drug knowledge. And so um, in summary, given that 80% of antibiotics are up to 80% are inappropriately prescribed um, worldwide for both prophylactic and therapeutic reasons, certainly has led to the support of many organisations um, to include dentists and dental teams into in antibiotic stewardship programs. And certainly a lot of these interventions tend to be like, customised bundles of interventions that since prescribing, there's so many factors, both clinical and non-clinical, that influence inappropriate antibiotic prescribing. But at the end of the day, there's very limited need for antibiotics in dentistry. As I was saying, dentistry is all about dental treatment and not drugs. And as such, there's significant opportunity for us to join the rest of our healthcare colleagues to contribute positively to the global stewardship movement. Thank you. Thank you so much, Leanne. That was um, excellent and um, really um, exciting to hear about drugs for dent. Um, yeah. I suppose not long before it becomes an app, hopefully, for <laughs> <laughs> the dentist to, um, 
to you. So I'd encourage um, any of our participants again, if they've got specific questions about Leanne's presentation to pop them into the Q&A or the chat and um, I'll keep an eye on those. Uh, but I would like to kick off with one question if that's okay, Leanne. So Absolutely. one of your slides talked about um, access to treatment being a really important factor um, yes. for um, dental care. Yeah. But we, we do know that there are access issues, um, especially in, um, you know, in yeah. dentistry where cost is a consideration for patients. Um, yes. Do antibiotics have a, um, just putting my devil's advocate hat on, do antibiotics have a role for patients that do have genuine access issues to seeking care in public dental clinics? It really is a big issue. It's a great, it's a great question and it's something that's been raised um, many times in terms of subsidising, especially public um, dental care in Australia. It, it's really, it's underfunded. Um, you know, wait lists um, it can be up to, they're generally up to two years to access general preventive dental care. And that's for the service about a third of the population really who are eligible. So there, there's really, it's, it's very, it's a very difficult situation. Um, and certainly in Australia, while we do have a predominance of private clinics in dentistry, as I was saying, that there really is underfunding in, in public dental care. They do have um, triage systems, of course. So if someone does have a raging toothache, they generally will be seen on that day. There are some systems in place, such as vouchers and things like that. So, And certainly we will see them in, in private. So if someone um, has a, a really bad toothache, but they can't be seen on that day in the public clinic because of the, the, they don't have the capacity, they can generally get a voucher and be seen in a, at a take that voucher to a, a private dentist and be seen at a, certainly at a subsidised cost. So there are those sort of systems in place to, to try and mitigate um, the problems with funding, but the, it, there needs to be more funding to, into public dental care. And as a result, because of, of, of that reason that we do, unfortunately, there, there is quite a bit of um, antibiotic prescribing in the meantime, um, because if people have a tooth infection and they can't be seen, then there's not much choice for it. Especially if they see their GP, there's not much choice in that respect. And we're doing some work with, um, um, Ruby Bison from NCAS as well in Department of General Practice looking at antibiotic prescribing um, by general medical practitioners for dental conditions and um, looking into and sort of having interviews with GPs at the moment about why this occurs, how often it occurs, the sort of factors that in, uh, influence their decisions in this regard. Thanks, um, Leanne. There's another question that's come through um, just about from Asher about the intersection between um, our previous speaker and um, uh, yourself about um, paediatric dentistry um, that occurs in children's hospitals uh, due to the need for a general anaesthetic, um, but wondering whether there are many dentists on AMS committees, I suppose. Um, would you know that if there are? No, I, I, I'm not that familiar. I, I'm not sure about that, actually. I don't know, Brendan, if you know a bit more about um, what happens at AMS committees and in hospital settings? I, I think it's a fascinating question. I was going to say, we don't have a permanent dentist on our AMS committee, though we've mm. liaised with dentists about different issues. But, you know, that's something to consider as a next step. Mm. I was going to ask you, Leanne, as well, take the opportunity. Um, yeah. I don't know um, exactly, but but are there any paediatric considerations in drug for dent Um uh, and if not, is there yeah. an opportunity for that as a as a next step too? Yes. So certainly one of the things that we found, I mean, I found from teaching students and also lecturing to dentists because dentists don't have to prescribe antibiotics very often for kids, um, but occasionally they do and they get, it's, um, they find it, it can be very confusing in terms of um, how to calculate dosages and appropriate and um, the right dosage and translating a, a weight to a, a liquid form and that sort of thing. And so there's certainly some aspects of drugs to dent which do help and assist with that um, as well. So. And we've just got another question here from um, Thomas, um, which is another interesting one about um, uh, dentists wearing a different hat. So um, considering a role in tertiary hospitals in uh, emergency departments and whether there's been any um, work done about um, placing a dentist in that specific setting. I do believe in um, in some tertiary hospitals there will be um, obviously dental units and and and, um, and dental and some some yeah some certain dental units and departments, but I don't think it's something that they have all the time. And certainly, um, I can imagine that with I mean there's a dental hospital hospitals of course, um, but they would also reach capacity as well with the amount of um, of unfortunately oral health is such a 
and oral health diseases, which are generally in most cases, the mass majority of cases preventable. Unfortunately, they're incredibly common, um, especially for children as well. Okay. Yeah. Thanks for that, Leanne. So I might just move on to our next presentation. So our next presentation uh, is going to be given by two speakers. So I'm just going to introduce um, uh, Associate Professor Asher Bowen first, and then I'll introduce the second speaker. So Associate Professor Asher Bowen is a clinician scientist working at Perth Children's Hospital as a pediatric infectious diseases specialist. She's also the head of the END RHD program at Telethon Kids Institute. Her research focuses on reducing the burden of infectious diseases that leads to rheumatic heart disease and other serious downstream health consequences for Australia's Aboriginal children. And she's also got studies spanning from both to the bush to the bench to the bedside. Um, she's in recognised internationally as a leader in rheumatic fever prevention, has developed world first tools for remote epidemiological research, including feasibility of molecular point of care tests for Streptococcus A, in the remote context. She's going to be joined by Dr. Thomas McMill. And um, Tom is a Gangaloo man who grew up on Gurung Gurung country in Gladstone, Queensland. During his medical studies at the University of Melbourne, he was an AIDA student director on the board. He is also now in his intern year at the Royal Brisbane and Women's Hospital. Prior to uh, medicine, worked, Tom worked as a pharmacist, so another double threat here <laughs> across community and hospital. However, most of his time was spent as a pharmacy officer in the Royal Australian Air Force. Tom's background in pharmacy um, invigorates his passion for antimicrobial stewardship, which led him to participate in the inaugural Hot North Antimicrobial Stewardship Academy. Whilst it's in his early days, he aspires to pursue a career either in dermatology or ophthalmology, always endeavouring to keep First Nations health as a focus in his practice. So welcome to both Tom and Asha, over to you both. Asha, I just think I'll get you to come off mute, please. Yeah, yeah. sorry, I just couldn't. Um... No, my on that was um, embarrassing. Um, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for the opportunity to present. Um, Tom and I will be presenting um, together and do want to bring an acknowledgement of country. Um, I'm sitting here on Wajapuja, the lands of the Noongar Nation in Perth, and um, really draw our attention once again to Uluru Statement from the Heart. And if you haven't read it or haven't read it recently, um, bring your attention back to this because I think it will be something that is um, a critical way for walking together and walking forward in this country and underpins much of what we'll be um, talking about today. So we're going to do our best to um, co-present this and it will probably be um, as much of a conversation between the two of us as it will be a presentation and I hope that that will be interesting and engaging. We are talking about the Hot North Antimicrobial Academy and um, it is a academy that we put together in um, 2019. And the way in which we um, we sort of did this was developing a leadership team. And you can see um, from the slide that, well, I guess maybe you can't tell this, but each of the people who are, um, have their photograph in this leadership team come from different parts of the country. And so we have Dr. Lorraine Anderson, who is um, the medical director of the Kimberley Aboriginal Medical Service up in the northern part of Western Australia, um, myself in Perth. We have Mike Stevens, who's a pharmacist at Nacho, the National Aboriginal Community Controlled Health Organisation, which has its um, headquarters in Canberra, but um, Mike is actually based in Tasmania. Um, Prof. Stephen Tong, who is a, a Melbourne ID um, physician, and then um, Trent Yarwood, who is um, based up in um, beautiful Cairns. And so uh, we've all had extensive experience working in remote sectors and um, in Northern Australia, but find ourselves in different parts of the country now. And so we're going to tell a bit of a story as to how we came to have an antimicrobial academy and then the evaluation of the first um, cohort. So Back in 2017, um, I had completed my PhD and it was a um, 
a randomized controlled trial looking at the treatment of um, skin sores. And I, I did like the connection that um, um, Brendan included um, from Margaret Chan's quote back um, looking at antimicrobial resistance and penicillin was available to treat skin sores, essentially abrasions, and also um, sore throats. And so what we did in this particular study was trying to find out um, whether we could get a very short course of oral antibiotics to work just as well as benzathine penicillin G for the treatment of impetigo in a highly endemic region. And the great news was that we found out that three days of oral cotrimoxazole, which was seven days shorter than any oral course that had ever been prescribed for impetigo, um, was effective in treatment of um, skin sores. However, when we finished that study, it got into guidelines very, very quickly. So it was published in um, The Lancet in um, December 2014. But almost before that, it was in um, CARPA manual, it was in the therapeutic guidelines, it was in local guidelines such as the Kimberley Skin Health Guidelines, and many others in hospital um, stewardship spaces, probably because of um, many of the authors being involved in um, these guideline leadership committees. Um, so it was very much um, translation into practice. But what we didn't know and couldn't track was whether there was a mechanism to monitor usage or potentially emerging resistance. So it was really important to sort of think about what could happen next. I mean, it's great to do science and to find out the answer to a question, but that question leads to many, many more questions. And we were wanting to know whether clinicians were using cotrimoxazole and whether resistance was emerging. So that led to the first project that um, I think I have mentioned before in one of these um, sessions, but it was a Hot North antimicrobial stewardship pilot. And so the Hot North, um, I guess, funding enabled us to look at um, activities that were going on across the northern parts of Australia in really trying to make sure that they were um, multi-jurisdictional and multidisciplinary. And so that was NHMRC funding, but one of the premises of it was to try and work in different ways. And so it was actually the first stewardship study ever conducted in remote Northern Australia. And we were able to include um, both Aboriginal community controlled health organisations, as well as um, government clinics in Queensland, Western Australia and Northern Territory um, in the audit. And it was predominantly using um, tools that have come out of NCAS and NAPS audits and things like that, but adapted to the remote setting. And it was led by clinician scientists and pharmacists, predominantly who had training or were leading stewardship in tertiary hospitals. And one of the things that we did find during that process was that there really were not a lot of Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander healthcare workers, clinicians, pharmacists working in this space with um, a lot of knowledge, skills, expertise to really take antimicrobial stewardship ship forward. So that, um, I guess, alerted us to a potential gap for more training needed. And so um, if I just talk to the next part of this particular um, study, you can see here the publication for um, this first ever antimicrobial stewardship audit um, across remote Australia. And since then, there have been a, um, several published one from Alice Springs and another one from Queensland, I believe. So it's it, it did set a precedent and then there has been more stewardship happening, which is fa um, fantastic. And so in this audit, you can see um, in the big sort of yellow sections, which are in the middle of each of the three graphs is skin and soft tissue infection. So it seems to be a big driver of the majority of prescriptions and also um, for different types of healthcare um, providers, how closely they were linked to guideline-based recommendations. So doctors on the left and nurses on the right. And so I guess um, I'm not meaning to get you into too much detail about these particular um, graphs, but really to think about um, the common conditions as well as um, how um, relevant to guidelines people were in their prescribing and habits. So we completed that study and we're trying to work out what to do next. And one of the, um, I guess, key things that we're very much aware of is that there was um, rapidly progressive um, antimicrobial resistance, um, particularly around Staph aureus um, across the remote north with these two graphs just demonstrating um, the increase of skin and soft tissue infection um, presentations to emergency department in the Kimberley, as well as um, the differential between Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal um, um, patients in presenting with this. And so it was a really serious burden that has um, been has progressed across the whole northern parts of Australia, where we see that more than 50% of um, Staph aureus infections are often methicillin resistant. So we had a lot of information about this. Um, however, 
the first and second antimicrobial resistance strategies actually have not addressed this at all. And we really hope for um, the next update to include a lot more relevant information about um, the um, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander health as well as remote health. So um, this has, I think, been a gap that's um, been very much identified. And uh, I do want to shout out to the guidelines that um, Leanne mentioned. Um, the national guidelines have now got a section on Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander health. So whilst it hasn't made it into um, our strategy, um, there's definitely been a whole lot of work in improving to make sure that this um, area gets the attention that it needs. So that really got us to thinking about how do you advocate for this to change and how do you generate a cohort of people to have a strong voice together? And so some of these papers were just examples of um, starting um, the conversations that were needed to really um, show those gaps as well as then um, um, change things. So in 2019, we... Um, decided that an output of that first antimicrobial stewardship audit in um, sort of the remote parts of Australia would culminate into an academy. That would be a sort of translational activity. And so in 2019, we wanted to um, think about a way in which we might be able to train a cohort of remote and Indigenous clinicians in anti antimicrobial stewardship. Um, raising the awareness of the need for these to be included in the national AMR strategy and some of the data that I just showed you, um, really developing skills and language in adv advocacy and transfer of these skills um, from tertiary hospitals to remote primary health care. And there have been a lot of drivers that have been happening over the course of this um, timeline, not only the academy, but there has been, I guess, a lot of move to try and um, involve primary health care much more so in stewardship. And that by um, extension has also led to involvement of remote primary health care. And I think developing and progressing the community controlled health organization leadership for antimicrobial stewardship. And we'll talk to that a little bit more at the end. So in 2019, we had funding for the academy. And I think um, the intention was to um, really have a face to face academy where we would come together regularly, have probably two or more participants per site so that they would have a colleague. Um, that it would be um, a really collegial learning environment. And we thought we would have um, full day sessions in convenient locations um, in a face-to-face -face context. And um, the meeting was actually just days before our international border closed um, in Australia. And we really felt the true impacts of, of COVID here in Australia. And so the, co the um, academy was delayed throughout 2020 and then reimagined in 2021 um, for uh, a, a, an entirely virtual um, uh, academy. So I'll talk to that a little bit more. So at one of these um, sessions in um, late 2020, we did advertise the academy as well as um, advertised it across social media through word of mouth emails um, and um, really wanted to attract a cohort of up to 12 um, Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander um, people who are working in healthcare or those also working in the Aboriginal community controlled health or government sector of remote Australia. So, Tom, I have a quick question for you. Do you remember how yeah. you heard about the Academy first? Yeah, I was actually um, working with Bart Curry up at uh, Menzies Institute doing my research as my final part of my med degree. And um, he, he shot me an email saying, I think you should do this. Um, so that's how I came on board. Um, and yeah, it, it fit in nicely with the work I was doing at the time. Um, and so we were super excited to have Tom join as both a pharmacist as well as a doctor in training at the time um, and really learnt his skills as well as um, I think learned a lot through participation as a member of the academy and one of the things we also did was to try and make sure that it was as accessible as possible for aboriginal health practitioners doctors nurses pharmacists making the application process pretty streamlined and simple and tom we've had a lot of feedback to say that that worked was that your experience as well yeah it was good um i think one of the biggest benefits that um was built into the application process was the requirement of uh your organization slash supervisor to support your application and provide a guarantee of uh, dedicated time um and so going into that um with that support knowing that you were going to be given the time um within your working uh capacity to actually participate 
was good because so often um, extracurricular educational opportunities um, you have to do in your own time and, and you have to do out of hours at odd odd times of day. Whereas um, this was nice because it was, it was, you know, relatively within working hours um, across the time zones in Australia. Um, but, um, you know, you knew you were supported by your, by your supervisors, your employers, um, your educational institute to, to be involved and um, that they were willing to, to um, you know, consider that and how you were scheduled and, and work around that with you. So that was really good. Awesome. Thanks. Thanks, Tom. Yeah, I picked up on a few of the things that we um, did try to do to make it um, as accessible as possible. And we had a very wide range of skill sets of people coming um, into the academy. So try to make sure that everything was as um, interesting, engaging as possible. So ultimately, we ran the academy. I don't know, Tom, you can talk to this one maybe about um, yeah. how it all worked and what you enjoyed about it. Yeah. So um, the Academy ended up running from um, March until November of 2021. Um, and uh, we had uh, 11 participants in the end. Um, and we had monthly lectures um, with two to three speakers each month from across different disciplines. Um, so we had, uh, and we also had, uh, yeah, so the two, two, day, two half days of MFT, MF, um, teams, which teams was a whole thing to learn, um, where we had our more intensive discussions and, and were able to share, I guess, resources and documents um, as well. Um, so it was good because you, you kind of got to know each other in a, in a conversational capacity across the year. Um, throughout the sessions and um, the the lecturers, the speakers that we had were super engaged and gave us a lot of time um, and again were happy to to engage on a conversational level and especially because uh, with the different I guess skill sets and backgrounds that we had with people coming into the academy there was different levels of knowledge um, and different I guess um, lenses on on um, how we approach any microbial stewardship in our day-to-day -day role. And it was great because our speakers were then able to sort of pull apart how the topic discussed that day was relevant to you and your capacity in your workspace. Um, and then we had our final session in Darwin in November, 2021, which was um, fantastic. Um, it was a really good get together. Um, ironically, um, it was being an antimicrobial stewardship event we were not immune to COVID um, and we uh, had to had to all bail out um, at the last minute thanks to a territory outbreak um, but um, nonetheless it was it was a really nice way to come together um, in a sort of like community type vibe um, because you you'd known these people for the whole for the whole year and um, and gotten to have some really great conversations about uh, you, you know, what you see day to day at work and, and, and in your practice. And um, then you got to actually have a chat and, and talk about that in person. And, and you kind of felt like you were reconnecting with friends that you'd met for the first time. <laughs> um, it did feel a lot like that. And so we tried to really cover um, a variety of topics from antimicrobials, um, what is antimicrobial resistance, um, really um, tried to focus on calling it drug resistance because we talked a lot about how tricky that big word is um, for um, consumers to really get their head around. And um, I think um, Trent Yarwood, one of the academy leaders, was um, had a great um, session on drug communicating drug resistance to health consumers. Um, we looked at um, hotspots, which is a way in which um, you might be able to look at, uh, I guess, local antibiograms for regions within um, Northern Australia. So the first tool that's been developed for that, which also came out of the Hot North um, funding um, program and also really um, focused on the strengths of the remote sector where guidelines have actually been the way in which um, uh, healthcare has been delivered for several decades preceded very much um, many, many years before the hospitals were really doing that. Um, mm. Lots and lots of, of guidelines and standard drug lists and other critical AMS tools are actually part of the framework of practicing healthcare in remote Australia. And so wanted to celebrate both the strengths, but also um, fill some of the gaps in knowledge. Um, Tom, anything else that you thought was cool about the Academy on this list? Um, 
No, like it was, that, I mean, that's a pretty comprehensive list. Um, it was, it was, yeah, it was, I think the hotspot was um, definitely, I, I think that really interested a lot of people um, because it was good to sort of know, it was good to see in a visual sense uh, where, where issues really lied um, and, um, and being aware, I guess, um, of how important stewardship is in particular locations. Um, so I think that was, yeah, a real highlight. I think then the idea of uh, the empowering individuals around the concept of, of conducting audits and, pro and projects in their local service um, was really good. Um, and I guess we'll touch on where that led us as we go a bit further into the presentation. Thanks, Tom. So um, in terms of really, because we were running Academy, we also recognized it was the first time this has been done and we wanted to evaluate. So we used a pre and post um, sort of knowledge attitudes practice survey of the participants, as well as the, um, the leaders and the lecturers who participated in the um, uh, Academy and also um, captured a lot of the experiences and impressions of our conversations throughout the course, which we've called yarning circles. Um, we also added in as we progressed different aspects. So we recognized the need for mentorship um, as part of it and added some of the mentors for um, the projects, realized that a month between sessions was possibly a little too long. And so um, introduced a coffee and chat session as a two week interval um, and also um, as project um, supervisor. So we did iteratively change it as we were going um, to make sure that we're meeting needs um, of participants. But ultimately, of the 11 participants who commenced, we had eight who completed the academy who came from um, all of the backgrounds that I mentioned, Aboriginal health practitioners, medical, pharmacy, nursing, from across WA, Queensland, South Australia and Victoria, and all of whom were like highly involved in different aspects of COVID work from immunization campaigns um, to caring for their community in um, the remote sector where um, COVID was a fear and a threat um, throughout 2021 and a lot of preparation required. And so that did mean that several of our um, academy starters were not able to complete their job. Circumstances changed quite dramatically during 2021. And I think probably that's the case for many people working in this sector across Australia. And but that we did set them a pretty intensive task, 20 lectures, nine months, 15 different lecturers to listen to. And we did provide all of the lectures um, recorded, um, which has been useful for future academies, but also was helpful to be able to participate um, if you couldn't get to a session particularly. Um, and so this is the areas of interest from the participants before the survey. I don't know if any of those ones jumped out as you, Tom, as they were your kind of um, preferred or interested areas. Yeah, I was, my, my research of thought was um, within skin health for renal patients um, with a First Nations focus in the top end. So um, it was very, yeah, I was, I, I'm, I'm a bit of a skin lover. So that was always my, uh, my key area of interest. Um. It was um, very clear that um, it was a combination of this clinical governance, cultural governance working um, hand in hand, and I think is a huge strength of um, working um, with First Nations um, uh, healthcare workers and, and communities and that partnership and, and really thinking about how we could embed both um, together. And um, I think that we learned a lot together about clinical governance, which was helpful to think about how cultural governments and community engagement could fit into that piece as well. And um, bush medicine absolutely came up a lot and um, talking about it in combination with antibiotics and um, different ways in which um, we could um, consider that as part of stewardship. So um, this slide really just shows you um, those th key themes that were of interest and um, I think a, a change in knowledge that was identified by each of the participants and summarised into um, improvements in skin health, surveillance techniques and tools, and Tom's talked a lot about um, audit, um, as well as hotspots, and the availability of resources um, that clinicians can, can lean on. And we didn't, I think, quite meet our mark that we're aiming for in terms of communication, media skills and advocacy, but I think um, have a lot of, um, I guess, opportunity for growth further to continue um, to address that. I think that um, some of the things that um, 
we were surprising strengths to this. Like, we, you know, as I said, we were thinking of having face-to-face in one site. We'd have bigger intervals between lectures and we had to um, pivot, I guess, because of COVID, but actually it enabled so much. Um, so, Tom, I think that um, we've talked about the application process. Um, the mm. lecturers that we chose, and we chose people that we knew who were working in the space, who had um, had influence up until now, um, I think we're highly rated by all of the participants. Yeah, and it's funny, like it's 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 nice now because you keep like running into people in this space, um, which is a really nice, um, I guess, uh, aspect of, of um, infectious disease and antimicrobial stewardship is that um, it's so relevant in in every space of medicine that you you do um, you see these familiar faces now and you're like oh hi. Hey. Um, like for example, Amy Leg, I run into at the Royal now, and I used to run into her at Menzies in Darwin, and she lectured us, and she's amazing and fantastic. And so it's really, it yeah, the lecturers were were equally all brilliant. And, and we've talked a little bit about how we purposefully built this into a work day so that it wasn't um, like it was respected by the organization because we recognized how critical stewardship really is to overall clinical governance and that it, if we didn't prioritize it during a work day then it wouldn't be prioritized and so we wanted to um, make that as a, as a key activity. Um, we didn't ever intend to run it entirely in an online format and so um, it, we were actually surprised at how um, we pivoted and changed things quickly to really try and build those relationships um, as needed and um, talked a little bit about um, some of the challenges with retention um, as well, um, partly because of COVID pressures and partly, I think, um, if we had have had a buddy at each site and had more um, face-to-face -face meetings, I think that probably would have been um, more engaging um, particularly. Um, I was just going to... Um, talk a little bit or ask Tom a little bit more about um, some of the um, things that we learned when we were presenting at the Hot North um, meeting in Darwin and um, some of like what your thoughts were on some of the projects that were completed. Yeah I think my the standout one that I always go back to is um, the, the project completed by one of the participants um, on surgical patients who um, were being stratified for antibiotic use based on um, aboriginality. Um, and in a particular audit uh, case that they had focused on, um, the, the patient had been um, prescribed pre-surgical vancomycin purely because they were Aboriginal. Um, and it had led to an AKI. And um, when going back and looking, there'd been no indication, um, no swabs to demonstrate MRSA in that patient. Um, and they'd literally only been given it based on their ethnicity rather than anything else. And so it was, a, it was an, an avoidable uh, medication um, adverse event um, that was, was really clearly linked to systemic racism and historic policy that had just never been revised. And I think what really came out of it is that um, Aboriginality is not a risk factor. It's not a health. It, it should never be seen as the risk factor. There's definitely... Uh, social determinants of health that Aboriginal people and Torres Strait Islander people are exponentially exposed to, but it's not the ethnicity, it's not the Aboriginality, Aboriginality that is the risk factor, and we need to remember that in our practice and not just be blindly treating someone in a different way because of the colour of their skin or, or their ethnicity. Um, and I think the audit tool was encouraging people to embed audits that these type of systemic features really came out, and it was yeah, it was pretty amazing to see and, and think that, you know, um, empowering people who, you know, the, the likes of the other academy participants and I, you prior to the academy, you may have not had the confidence to go and do that audit and look into those things and then speak up and say, hey, this is not okay, this is not right, this needs to be improved. And that's where the academy got us to, to a, to a bit, to a level where we felt capable to say, hey, I want to audit this and I want to be able to discuss my findings and improve improve the service we provide, um, which I think is a real fantastic outcome. 
Awesome, Tom. And I think I um, definitely want to reiterate the importance of um, all for all of us as we're looking at um, any of our processes, making sure that it's not imposing a historical system onto um, a vulnerable population per se, because it's not um, the ethnicity that makes the vulnerability, it is the circumstances um, within which um, people are living, and that has a historical element to it. So um, encourage all of us to keep looking every single time at our policies and thinking about um, how we um, continue to improve them. There was um, other projects we did. Uh, there was a lot of focus on skin and soft tissue infections and um, appropriately so because we knew that that was the um, cause of the greatest number of antibiotic prescriptions from the um, initial audit that we did. And um, and, and also looked at um, other things around urinary tract infection and the value of traditional Aboriginal medicine as an alternative or an adjunct to antimicrobials and, and really continuing to strengthen the story around that as well. Um, so having completed the um, academy, Tom, how has it helped you, I guess, in, in the, the subsequent year? We've got we've had the opportunity to co-present a few times now, and um, it's, it's always um, great to hear your stories and reflections. Yeah, look, it is. It's it's interesting, um, especially now as a as an intern um, in a tertiary hospital. And I have to say, the Royal is a fantastic hospital. I'll caveat everything I say with that. Um, uh, but um, it is interesting because you do find yourself in in situations where you potentially are more confident in advocating, especially in certain environments where uh, antimicrobial stewardship is often a little bit tenuous and and uh, and I made the joke when I presented this presentation at the um, Australian Indigenous Doctors Association um, around um, the surgical space and um, and advocacy in that space can be uh, quite challenging sometimes um, especially with how much some of our colleagues um, are, are very affiliated with uh, PIPTAS and vitamin P as we like to call it and it seems to just be the thing that gets thrown around for any little cough cold sneeze um, but it's good because, you know, like uh, having done the academy, it's nice now to be able to say, oh, well, you know, have we, have you actually looked at the guidelines on this? And it's interesting how different services, different hospitals will have different ways of managing um, antimicrobial stewardship. And I think the my experience as a pharmacist, um, what I, what I, the best service I saw was probably during my time at Royal Prince Alfred in Sydney. And um where there was a dedicated ID team who oversaw antimicrobial stewardship, and I think that's it, it. That's a it's a resource heavy approach, but I think it's a real. It's an it was an asset, and um, I worked on an ortho room, uh, ortho room and trauma ward there. So again, a lot of a lot of antibiotics thrown around, uh, um, but it was good because you got to see the conversation that played out, and I think that. A, a really if it where funding exists that's a fantastic model because I think getting back to the crux of what the academy was about it's about advocacy and being open to having conversations in a non-combative way because it is really intimidating when you challenge someone's clinical decision but if you can do it in a way which the academy taught where you're not necessarily uh like scolding someone or, or, or criticizing you're saying have you considered this and let's have a conversation about what could be better that's a great way to uh, i guess approach approach these these situations and and ultimately um, improve patient outcomes which is the aim the main aim for for this whole body of work thanks tom so today we've actually got um, Academy number two. Some of the participants are here um, have joined in. This is um, one of their lectures um, for um, the sort of week or the year. And we've actually run it um, much more concertina this year. Once again, COVID did get in the way of the first half of 2022 um, as we're all grappling across the country with how to um, um, continue all of our everyday work as well as respond to um, increasing demands for healthcare with COVID. And so the National Aboriginal Community Controlled Health Organisation has um, really partnered with us to move as the Hot North website has, um, I guess, um, that project is finishing up, moving um, all of the academy um, resources across to Nacho, where we would, um, we're still looking for some more funding to take the academy forward for, for future editions. But um, it has been um, 
a, a wonderful journey. These are some of the people involved in the hybrid meeting in Darwin. And um, just wanted to wrap up with, um, we have got 10 participants this year, um, including those from um, a variety of different fields, once again, having fortnightly lectures. And um, I think that that ability to then um, think about um, how do you go from establishing a, a training module like this through to um, where should it sit in the future is sort of the, the part that we're in, in progress with at the moment. And realize it's probably time, um, um, Kristen, for us to take some questions. And you can send them to either Tom or myself. Thank you very much, Asha. Um, that was a fantastic presentation and really interesting to hear about um, the, the mechanics of how, how the academy worked and get some insights from somebody who's uh, enjoyed the benefit um, of the academy last year. Um, I think um, we're going to have, we have one question that's already come through, which is exciting. And I think it's kind of, my, I had a question as well that kind of links into the same um the same thematics of, of the one that's come through. I was really interested, Asher um, and Tom, when you articulated it so so well, uh, the concept of considerations for ethnicity versus circumstances, because generally within guidelines, it's usually a tick box exercise of, does the person have an Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander background? And then there's a specific recommendation for that. So I think sometimes that kind of binary recommendation has a lot of limitations to it. and um, any uh, kind of advice for navigating that interaction with the patient to try and elicit whether those recommendations are appropriate for the patient in a culturally sensitive way. Um, obviously, it's not going to be an easy a dot point exercise and every situation is going to be very different, but any high level advice um, about those interactions? I think there's like, apart from um, ear infections, which are the one thing where we know there's clear evidence for treating based on ethnicity. I think at the end of the day, you just really need to, you can be considerate of a patient's um, ethnicity without it being considered a risk factor. I think you always need to go back to uh, considering the greater social, the social determinants. Um, I think in, 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 in response, in regards to like what Steve has said in the chat there, I, like I actually think the statement there is fine that, um, you know, if there's an endemic area, then that actually, it makes sense um, to have consideration around how you would address um, certain, certain treatments. Uh, but I think ultimately it shouldn't be the ethnicity that drives your clinical decision at the end of the day. Um, in the vast majority of situations. And, and I think you see it in a lot of marginalised groups um, and especially it's not taught well to junior doctors. Um, and I see this in the ED all the time um, currently where I work where, um, and I was actually having this conversation I was out cycling to friends this morning where we don't, we don't teach people how to stratify based on marginalised uh, demographics well. Um, and uh, I had a friend who I was cycling with who was talking about uh, going to ED for a completely irrelevant uh, presentation. And um, when when doing his social history had um, had mentioned that he was uh, homosexual and the doctor immediately said, well, we better test you for AIDS. And I feel like it's the same, or like we, we better do an STI screen and run, uh, and run for and just check for HIV. It was completely irrelevant the presentation but it's that same type of putting people into boxes without considering uh the 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 more relevant social circumstance the greater picture and i think um a, a, there's a lot of goodwill that probably is ill-directed in this space because people do want better outcomes for first nations australians um and in some ways that's you know really heartwarming but it just needs to be done in a way that doesn't actually uh, perpetuate historical racist structures within our medical system. And we really know they exist. Like they really do shine through. Ash has probably got a more um, intelligent way to explain what I've said. <laughs> That was amazing, Tom. I didn't actually want to jump in because I think just really summarised it well. 
One thing I think that did come out in um, that particular project was that um, the local antibiogram hadn't really ever been um, engaged with and no one had ever thought about it from, uh, um, I guess, ethnicity perspective. And when that lens was put on it, it was very clear that MRSA rates in that area were about 1% to 2% and that Aboriginal um, and Torres Strait Islander people had no higher risk of having MRSA than anyone else who lived in that community. So it was probably a national type of approach that was um, perpetuated locally that an antibiogram check would have changed that and then looking at it with that different lens on would have um, raised that perspective. So I think and the question Steve raised is that um, knowing your local antibiogram and thinking about how that applies to the patient in front of you. Um, and particularly, you probably might also have some information about that particular person if we're talking about, say, um, antibiotic resistance, that they might already have an alert whether they've had a you know resistant infection or actually, in fact, if they've had the sensitive, like an MSSA, a methicillin susceptible staph aureus infection. And so using both, I guess, your knowledge of regional antibiograms as well as your knowledge of the patient who's there with you and trying to make the best informed um, decision for them that doesn't incorporate, um, I guess, assumptions and judgments, um, mm -hmm. but actually uses um, the available knowledge wisely. So um, I, I, I didn't really want to say that, but it's just the local antibiogram, I think, with the use of hotspots and different things that we, we learned about was really, really informative to better um, stewardship and um, I, I think um, any of these conversations are enriching to think about better ways of, um, of moving um, moving these conversations forward. Yeah, I think just on that point as well, it's really important, like Asha just said, to know your patient. And it goes back to, I guess, to, to a, a, a point from Brendan's talk as well about, um, I guess, people are, are transient and move around and um a lot of a lot of first nations australians uh, can be very transient as well and and actually taking the time to to understand your person their journey where they've come from will make you will help you make a better clinical decision in the context of everything else that we spoke about rather than jumping in and and, and stratifying them based on ethnicity thank you both i think that was um really well articulated and definitely um, answered that question. Any other um, questions before we move on to the last presentation? No? Okay. Um, so the last presentation is kind of a, a wrap up from me. Um, and uh, it's a overview of um, some of the um, chapters we've discussed and alluded to from the AMS book that is published by the Australian Commission on Safety and Quality in Health. So if you bear with me, I'm just gonna share my screen. Okay. So I would like to just acknowledge um, my country as well. So um, the traditional owners and custodians of um, the land on which I'm presenting, which is the Gadigal people of the Eora, Eora Nation. And I just like to pay respects to elders past, present and emerging. So just a bit of background about the AMS book or the Antimicrobial Stewardship Book. It was first published way back in 2011. There was a revision in 2018. And since that time in 2018, um, we've been progressively publishing chapters um, along the way. Um, and we'll get back into which chapters they are in a sec. But really the overarching aim of the book is designed to provide clinicians and managers working in all healthcare sectors with evidence, expert guidance, tools that they need to both initiate and sustain AMS activities in a diverse range of practice settings, obviously bearing in mind that uh, one size doesn't fit all in um, AMS activities across different settings. So essentially, it describes the roles um, of those responsible for establishing and implementing programs, as well as how prescribers, pharmacists, infection control practitioners, nurses, midwives, all clinicians um, can contribute to AMS within their practice because antimicrobial stewardship um, belongs to everybody, not just infectious diseases, microbiologists or AMS pharmacists. 
So these are the progressive chapters that we have um, released since the revision in 2018. So you can see we started out with general practice, then moved into um, antimicrobial stewardship in the care of children, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, community and residential aged care, rural and remote hospitals and health services, dental practice, private hospitals. And just when I thought I was done with all the chapters, there is a chapter 20 in the works now that will be um, antimicrobial stewardship for outpatient um, parenteral antimicrobial therapy, otherwise known as OPAD or HIF in some settings. And I'd just like to acknowledge um, all the panellists today because all of them have been involved with their relevant chapters. And essentially that's what I think one of the great strengths of all the different chapters are is that they're so collaborative with experts in the field because um, the aim of the commission was really to make these resources uh, useful, tangible and um, realistic as to what resource settings were for different contexts. So just um, thought I'd focus on the three chapters, kind of reinforcing the messaging from our panellists earlier on today. So um, Brendan will have heard this all before, so I apologise to you, Brendan, um, but we'll just get into the Aboriginal, uh, the um, children chapter first. Um, so one of the reasons why we thought it was really important to have a chapter dedicated to um, children was because some of the, the data that we could see emerging was that children are exposed to a lot of antibiotics. And there can be many different reasons for this. Obviously, they've got a developing immune system, developing structures, both for um, in nose and throat regions. But essentially, it was a kind of an alarming thing that for patients less aged less than 65 years, the highest rate of antibiotic prescribing is for the children between the ages of two and four. Um, and antimicrobial exposure in very young children can um, disrupt the gut, um, the developing gut microbiota, and that's in a way that's a little bit different. And whilst antimicrobials do that for all um, people who consume them by disrupting the gut microbiome for children, there is evidence of associated risks with um, necrotizing enterocolitis, fungal infections, childhood asthma, allergy, dermatitis, and even obesity in later life. Children um, have uh, special challenges when it comes to antimicrobial stewardship. So there's often a lower threshold for prescribing antibiotics, and that can be sometimes due to uncertainty and risk perceptions. Um, parental concern and expectations for antimicrobials can often drive use. Um, and that can be often as well because children tend to have difficulty articulating things. Uh, a lot of the time, so the assessment of the patient can be particularly challenging. There are fewer antimicrobials available in this space and they're not so well studied, so there tends to be a lot of off-label use. Um, IV to oral switch, as Brendan mentioned, is a particular aim in this population, but moving into the oral space, the taste of liquid formulations can be a major challenge. Uh, then moving on to the dental practice chapter. So one of the... Um, the reasons why this chapter was developed was because more and more um, the realisation that antimicrobials are consumed in the primary and community healthcare setting as opposed to the acute care setting has um, really driven where a lot of the efforts have gone um, nationally, both at the Commission and for other associations and organisations as well. So I think the um, estimation currently is that approximately 80% of antimicrobials that are consumed for human health are done so in the community as opposed to um, acute services such as hospitals. So settings like dental practices and other um, primary community health settings, whether that's community pharmacy, general practice, um, wherever antimicrobials are prescribed and consumed really require interrogation into how we can optimize their use. So as, as Leanne uh, well articulated before, there is we know that there is overprescribing and inappropriate management of antimicrobials um, for dental practice. And some of the common agents that are used are amoxicillin, metronidazole, and amoxicillin with clavulanic acid. And particularly the last agent there, amoxicillin with clavulanic acid, is considered a broad spectrum oral agent. So again, interrogating why that might be the case um, for its common use in um, the dental setting. Interestingly, from our PBS data, we know that dental antimicrobial prescriptions um, dispensed under the PBS are decreasing over time, which is encouraging. Um, 
but it's you know not an insignificant number there so it's definitely something that warrants consideration for um, optimization for the current um, guidelines that um, recommend prophylaxis. They really recommend prophylaxis far less um, often than in the past, but many um, dental practitioners may be familiar with older guidelines and that can be what drives practice. Um, but studies have also shown that um, shorter, sharper courses, for example, 3D, three days are more effective um, provided that drainage of the source of infection has been performed. So a lot of the time, sometimes it's going to be a duration issue for optimising uh, prescribing as well in that context. So those were some of the main recommendations for the dental chapter of the AMS book. And finally, I'd just like to talk about the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples chapter. Um, so we know that there is a greater burden of infectious diseases than non-Indigenous Australians, and that's amplified in rural and remote areas. Um, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people can of, often experience a greater burden of chronic diseases as well, and that can drive infectious diseases for considerations. There's a different case mix to the non-Indigenous population, but there's also a really important need to treat infections promptly and appropriately. So there are some uh, examples that were interrogated in the chapter of clinical situations where antimicrobials are crucial. So for group A streptococcus, which can contribute, um, cause rheumatic fever and then rheumatic heart disease. Um, benzathine penicillin G is really the recommendation there, but that's a long-term treatment that's going to be really um, burdensome to people who require it for the rest of their lives. So these are situations where avoiding rheumatic fever and consequently rheumatic heart disease are really important. Um, also chronic superative otitis media can cause disabling hearing loss. And um, we also know that med middle ear infections for non-Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, there's evidence for antibiotics being of little benefit in this area. So there can be some conflicting messaging as well to consider. So really the need to um, avoid overprescribing, which can drive antimicrobial resistance is a key consideration. But AMR we know is problematic. Um, so Asha really articulated this well. Um, obviously these are kind of aggregated um, considerations for antimicrobial resistance. So knowing your local antibiogram as was highlighted earlier is really important, but we do know that um, there are high rates of um, MRSA, especially in Northern Australia. There's emerging considerations for azithromycin resistance in strep pneumo and emerging gram negative resistance in urinary tract pathogens as well. There's also a consideration for surveillance gaps in um, this particular population because antimicrobial use in the community uh, is not um, captured by PBS sometimes and when it's provided by um, the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander community controlled health organisations. Um, so that's a uh, consideration where we might have a bit of a blind spot into antimicrobial use um, and then con consequently considering that with um, emerging resistance patterns. So really the need to balance um, prompt treatment in an at-risk population without driving any further antimicrobial resistance. Um, there was also part, one of the, um, the things that I thought was really wonderful about the chapter was um, a real kind of in-depth uh, consideration for um, cultural safety and how targeted strategies can really optimise um, the use of antimicrobials and considering the audience what, um, what, you know, what they might consider is um, a little bit more uh, digestible for the information as well and making sure that not, the messaging is simple, effective and it, it can be really difficult to communicate antimicrobial resistance to um, populations where there are different considerations as well. So how, how does an organisation necessarily go about that? And I thought these were some really great examples that are, that are highlighted in the chapter as well. So I mentioned next chapters of the book. So chapter 20 is in the works, but essentially I think the, um, the aim is to consider any future work for the AMS book um, would really be anything that's considered an emerging risk. So more and more, um, you know, antimicrobial stewardship is going to have, you know, 
challenges going forward. One of them, uh, emerging risks at the moment, can be considered for non-medical prescribers and how that might be um, best accommodated to non-medical uh, non prescribers and optimising antimicrobial usage. So essentially, you know, it's a work in progress and the chapters will always need a bit of updating and refreshing, but it can be, re it's really, I think, a wonderful resource because it highlights a lot of that um, high level considerations for antimicrobial stewardship, acknowledging that one size doesn't fit all and helping people develop localised strategies to improve AMS wherever they might be. And I'll just finish off there with um, a little plug for the Commission's website for antimicrobial stewardship and encourage you all to have a look at the book and have a read if you haven't done so before. And I'll just stop sharing my slides there and happy to take any questions. Welcome, Kaz. So sorry, I came in at the end. I'm going to have to sit up late and catch up with all the webinars today. I stupidly am on ward service as well. So there you go. I've been tripped, punished. Sounds like it's been a fantastic. I've been getting texts from people saying what a great session it's been. So that's wonderful. Thank you so much, everyone, for um, talking. And I think, um, you know, as we know, we always put these videos up on the NCAS website and, and people do actually watch them and it's a really important resource um, for those of you who I'm not sure if you caught the webinar with the Fleming Fund fellows but you know with support these low middle income countries are actually able to develop really great AMS programs and they look to um, groups like you Leanne and Asher and you know, the resources that the Commission put together, all of those things they actually use and they really look to us to help um, design their programs. So all, everything that you do is really important. Thanks, Kaz, that was really cool. I loved how all of the um, stories interconnected and hadn't quite appreciated, Kristen, um, how you are gonna wrap it all up and um, all of the different chapters. So. Um, um, I, I think um, it's it's been lovely to see sort of the, the weaving stories and um, it sounds like those have been weaving throughout the week of lectures that have been happening. I just wanted to add as well, I, um, I'm obviously a big plugger of ethnicity has not been a risk factor, but um, and, or any form of marginalisation not been a risk factor, but um, and I think Kristen, you touched on this in your, in your wrap up there, it's still so important to always ask your patients. So if they are Aboriginal, Torres Strait Islander, because it might not be the thing that changes your practice, but having that data is so important in the work that is being done by these amazing people to be able to actually stratify and, and create better outcomes. Because if we know what we're, what we're faced with, we, we can allocate better resources, especially from a, uh, a geographical perspective we know that the more regional and remote you get the you know the more resource poor we become so if we know there's a higher need in these locations which are predominantly where our first nations people are accessing healthcare, um then you know we can we can make a bet we can actually then build cases and and, and get have the evidence to, to support changes to the system so um yeah, always please ask your patients as well um, if they identify as Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander. Thanks, Tom. That's a um, great, great message to um, to take home with. Is there any other questions from, from the group? I can't see any or none in the chat. I was actually going to say, um, Tom and Asha, you know, thanks so much for your presentation. It was fantastic. And it was a really good point about not stratifying purely by ethnicity because in our Current, it makes me think of in our current dental guidelines for prophylaxis, um, there is a, a disclaimer there saying, you know, certain uh, conditions, if you're, if you identify as Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander, all those SES, you automatically will, will should be considered for prophylaxis um, as a blanket rule. And that's that's a lot of the population once you, I mean, how you, and how do you define that as well? So we constantly, we have that question come up from students saying, you know, this person has a concession card because we treat them at the dental hospital, they automatically get prophylaxis for that reason, you know, stratifying by social determinants of health is an example. 
Um, and there certainly needs to be a lot more work in that space having said that. And I was sort of, I sort of alluded in my talk that we really lack um, dental, we certainly, we certainly lack data on um, antibiotic on the, on the resistome, in uh, the oral resistome that is, um, in order to make those um, judgment calls at the moment. So there's certainly, there's certainly a lot of uh, room to, to do research in this space to be able to make those, inform those decisions and policies like, for later on. Yeah, and I think um, that's a really important point there, Leanne, about um, ethnicity or a social determinant of health being that yeah. just a risk factor, not necessarily a fake complete yeah. as to being a mm. binary consideration for yes. um, driving down guidelines. So I think um, more um, knowledge and, and language in that space would yeah. definitely be helpful. And education as well, and how to, um, and again, I think, Tommy, you said that, you know, junior doctors are not taught this one, and I, but I think it's that sort of generally all around, it's, you know, to sometimes guidelines can feel very binary and patients are not that. So, um, yeah, to be able to make those judgment calls. So, you know, we always talk about impl the importance of implementation, implementation science principles now with guidelines. So two easy things that people are going to do. One is to look at a framework called the Implementability Framework, the GLIA Framework. It's on the NHMRC oh, yes. website. And I think, Lee, I'm not sure if you've used it, you used it Leanne, yep. but Jeff We're... McCourtney's used it for the Reflexes Guideline. Yeah. Well, um, Leanne and I have got work oh, to yes, publish on it. Me. Yeah, yeah we do. Right. <laughs> a really, really important framework. Um, and then the second thing is the ACT Framework. And um, this is a very simple um, concept that whenever you're developing a clinical pathway or a clinical guideline, that you make it very clear within the guideline or the pathway, who are the actors? Is it the nurse? Is it the, is it the GP? Is it the, who in the hospital needs to do what and when and why? If you have that clearly elucidated in your clinical pathway, then it makes it much easier for that for that person to work within their scope of practice. So sepsis is a perfect example where you can have nurse initiation that they can, you know, initiate the pathway, pop the oxygen on, put the cannula in, take the blood cultures, lactate. They can do that. Yeah. Then they can call the medical staff to get the fluids, the antibiotics. That that is a single intervention that that has led to the success of the pathway that we developed in Victoria because it enabled the nurses to be empowered to get things going. So this is a common concept, um, I think, in um, hospitals, probably more so than the community, but perhaps in the in the Northern Territory where you have in community nurses, they need to be empowered to, to do things to get things going. So I think that's, you know, two simple frameworks just to think about when, when the next time you, when next time you decide to make a guideline about something, you know, have I got those bits of information in there that allow people to actually execute and do the guideline well? Okay, I think that's probably a good place to leave off on. We've now kind of made it to time as well. So thank you to all our attendees um, for listening to our presentations today. And thank you to all the panelists for your excellent presentations. Thanks very much, everyone. Thanks. Thanks for having us. Thanks very thank much. And thank you today um, for, for sharing today, Kristen. We really appreciate um, you wrapping it all up together. Um, I just want to shamelessly plug that we have three more webinars left for Any Microbial Awareness Week. Uh, general practice tonight uh, and the immuno immunocompromised patients and an aged I'm care session that. tomorrow. Kaz is chairing the immunocompromised first one tomorrow. So um, I put the NCAS website link in the chat and you can um, continue to register those.